From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of hot chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Hey, thanks for joining me today. Today, my guest uh, is from the band Big Daddy Weave, Mike Weaver. Uh, Welcome to the show. Man, thank you so much for having me on. So, uh, Big Daddy Weave, that was your your nickname in high school, right? Yeah, kind of a conglomerate of some nicknames. If you're my size in the South, you are Big Daddy. My last name is Weaver, and evidently in organized sports, you can't have a two-syllable last name. So, Big Daddy Weave it is. <laughs> so, there you go. So, you were Big Daddy Weave, and so now the band name is Big Daddy Weave. Yes. So, Kind of like an Alice Cooper thing. You're you're Big Daddy Weave, and the name also of the band is Big Daddy Weave. And I just That's wanted it. I just wanted to see if I could put Big Daddy Weave and Alice Cooper in the same sentence. <laughs> that was amazing. I, I really I was really blessed by that. I mean that is so awesome. And their next single "School's Out," but I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's awesome. great. I'm a big Alice Cooper fan, so that's awesome. We got Big Daddy Weave and Alice Cooper. You know, a lot of similarities between the two acts, but to, except for the makeup. But other than that, <laughs> and the cutting your head off at the end of the show, you don't do that. You but everything else is so right on. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks for being on the show. Uh, the band is going to be uh, in Murfreesboro uh, this Sunday. Uh, the 31st, uh, New Vision Baptist Church in Murfreesboro. And you can go to BigDaddyWeave.com to get more info on that. So, uh, Mike, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the band and uh, kind of, I guess, starting from those days. Um, I know your first album came out in 2001, so you've been making music now as a band for 18 years. Can you talk to us a little bit about the beginning of your, you know, your Big Daddy Weave, your, you know, your, your in Mobile, and then you go to Florida, I believe, to be... Uh, a music director and then how did how did the band form and how did it get started well you know it was it was i was leading in little gulf breeze florida is where i'm from man, just outside of pensacola and a pastor of mine kind of made it a, a prerequisite of the job as a worship leader to go to school and i was really distracted by writing songs and just kind of being in church stuff and so he sent me about an hour and a half away to little mobile alabama and he said, look, focus on school during the week and come home on the weekends and lead worship. And so I went there and I met all the rest of the guys from Big Daddy Weave. And we, we've been doing this ever since. So we actually started in 1998. So our first label release was in the early 2000s. But it was like, so we've been together now for, gosh, this is our 21st year together. And I can't, I can't believe after this long, we were just leading worship on campus. And it's like it never stopped. I feel like at some point somebody's going to tell us, Dude, you got to get a real job or whatever, but it, but it never happens. So so don't don't encourage them to find us or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and your brother Jay is also in the band, and he's has he been yes. in the band from the beginning? He has, he has, and um, he's he's the bass player for the group. And then um, it was the first time we ever got together. We were like, hey man, um, uh, we met a, met a sax player, Joe Shirk, and he was actually rooming with a drummer at the time at school, and so that was kind of the first little. Uh, incarnation of big daddy weave oh, amazing and so you've had oh my goodness i don't know how many number ones you've had but you've pretty much just lived on uh, christian radio over these these uh these 18 years that you've been making records um can you talk to us a little bit about you know the music industry is all about celebrity and about fame uh that's how they build acts that's how they sell records is by making them celebrities and highlighting the fame and and now you're however you're in the the ministry can you talk to me how you navigate uh from someone who has a heart for ministry and also being in the music industry where there's an yes. industry built around fame and celebrity yes. can you talk to me a little bit about how you personally navigate that you know what, man? I think it's uh, it, it's about the secret place, man. It's about it's about who you really believe that you are. There's a brother of ours, man. We look up to him so much. Russ Lee has been singing for New Song and doing his own stuff for years and years and years. And he said to us when we first came to Nashville, because we were being so let down by meeting with like industry people who were telling us kind of like the 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 ugly truth of the fact that really this is a business or whatever. Right. And so we were just being so let down because we were there to, 
see people come to know Jesus more and to encourage people in their walk with the Lord. And so he said, first of all, don't ever read your press kit. <laughs> this, is, this is what he said, you know? And, and then he, and he said, this is the thing. It's like, that this is just the machine. This part is just the machine, you know, that your heart is what the machine helps get where it needs to go. You know what I mean? And it's and when I began to realize that, um, there was a conflict in my heart for years with how, you know, how do we do this? Is it a business? Is this a ministry? Is it like, where, how can this work together? And for a long time, I thought it couldn't, but when you realize it is just a vehicle, and that, you know, the, the only thing that can steal your soul or, or steal your heart is you giving it away. And so, man, we have some incredible, incredible label people. And, man, they do an amazing job of helping get the word out and get, get stuff to places and all of that kind of stuff. But where our interests really, 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 really intersect is the fact that that one record sale also represents a person. And to me, that is where I could all of a sudden get on board with being okay with what this machine was, was that, man, that's a person that Jesus loves. And, you know, I, I learned this lesson a long time ago um, that, you know, if you have a heart for the one, the Lord, the Lord showed me this, man. If you have a heart for the one, which is him, and you have a heart for one, that one that he left the 99 for, they're always going to be out there, man. You know, and so... You know, we we make these records and we do this as long as the Lord shows us this is where we're supposed to be. But where the whole thing comes down to for us is just kind of, you know, it's it's the lives of people that are represented by those numbers that the the label gets so excited over or whatever. You know? Yeah, I have I have a good friend. He I'm not going to mention his name, but he's like one of the top booking agents in Christian industry, and, and he he has a thing where he says, "This is a uh, a business." It's not a ministry. It's a business where sometimes ministry happens. And, you know, so from a booking agent perspective, you know, I see where he's thinking that. But there's a part of me that goes, uh, you know, I don't, I don't. But I understand, like, your, your label, Fervent Records, if they don't sell records, they can't pay their bills. They right. can't stay in business to put another right. Big Daddy Weave album out. So, I mean, it, it, it is an interesting dichotomy between we have to make profit or we can't do this or yes. or somebody just has to give us funding that we can keep doing this. So, yes. how, you know, so how do you feel about that, about the business slash ministry uh, aspect of that? Well, I, I think actually what, what it's come down to for us is the label gets to handle all that other stuff so that we really can go minister, you know, and that's, that gets to be our, our focus. And, um, and I love that now. I love that now. It took a long time to understand. It took a long time to figure out whose role was what, you know. Um, but, you know, so if, if you see our name plastered on something or whatever, it's because somebody's kind of making a thing happen or whatever. But when we show up where we show up, we're going to show up and we're, we want to listen to what Jesus wants to do at that place. And that's a beautiful thing for us because we can sort of forget about the other part at that thing. I mean, there's stuff that we have to take into consideration. I mean, our manager, Jim, is a huge blessing at kind of like dancing between those two worlds because he does know our heart and he does know uh, that, that we're in this to, man, to see people come into a relationship and be have the, have a relationship with Jesus, like to, to be encouraged in that and to, to walk in real life with Jesus, not just like religion, not just, you know, and we encounter so many hurt people in church all the time, you know, and for us not to have to think about all the business junk that goes with it, man, it's a huge blessing for us to, to, you know, take this into places everywhere we go and just, and just get to make the main thing, the main thing. You know what I mean? I do. You're listening to the Rick Altizer show on bot radio. My guest today is Mike Weaver from the band Big Daddy Weave, and they're going to be in Murfreesboro the Sunday, the 31st, at New Vision Baptist Church, and you can get more info about the band and uh, where they'll be playing and, and their albums and things by going to BigDaddyWeave.com. I saw you on the Dove Awards this year where you sang Jesus, I Believe, and uh, that was amazing. You had uh, choir with you. Uh, you had 
you know, people playing strings. Uh, you know, how did you put all that together? Is that something you that you just did for the Dubs? Do you, do you how big of a band do you have when you tour? Did you know? Um, actually, it's it's not anything that fantastic, you know. But it was really cool. We were sort of recreating a thing that happened at the first of last year. Um, we had an invitation to play at Carnegie Hall, which is a huge honor, you know, for musicians. That's a that's a cool. It's a really beautiful venue. But it was so sweet because the Lord turned that venue into into a church that night, dude, you know. And I, I, I loved that so much. I I was so nervous, man, to play there. And, you know, we we were so out of our element in many ways. But, um, man, a, a brother um, put together this entire experience of this choir and then this whole sort of like symphony thing. And, man, it was just a – it was an incredible night. And, and he was sharing – uh, later he's like, well, man, we, we've been invited to do something on the Dove Awards. And he's like, we would love for you guys to come and let's just create one of the mo- like recreate one of the moments from Carnegie Hall. And that, so that's how the whole thing happened. And it was, it was a really special thing, man. I, I love doing it that way. So currently though, we travel with the five of us in Big Daddy Weave, but then we do have two string players out with this. Jonathan Chu on violin, Becca Bradley on cello, and man, it I just I love the extra element that the strings bring. I think it's a really sweet thing. That's amazing. And uh there's the the classic joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? So how did you get to Carnegie Hall? The joke is, you know, <laughs> practice, but uh then the other list is right turn at thirty first or whatever, I don't know. But uh <laughs> I think i that's probably the way it happened. For me, that was the that was the magic of it for me. It was I just got to wake up on the bus and then it was like we were there, you know. And so that was that's that's a beautiful thing about traveling by bus is just, you know, you, you get in this little sarcophagus every night and then you show up somewhere new. And it's like it's really awesome, man. So and this in this day, it was Carnegie Hall. It Amazing. Was a beautiful experience. Well, you can find uh, uh, Mike and the band Big Daddy Weave, uh, the 31st in Murfreesboro at New Vision Baptist Church. And you can get more information about uh ticket info and where they'll be playing and all that kind of fun stuff by going to bigdaddyweave.com. So, uh, so Mike, um, you know, as, as we're, I'd like to talk about songwriting now, if you don't mind kind of transition into, into songwriting, you know, there is a craft element of songwriting kind of like, you know, making clay pots every, every now and then you learn how to make a clay pot and every now and then you might make a good one, but after you make about a thousand clay pots, pretty much every clay pot you make is pretty good. So there's a craft to songwriting, but there's also, as you're writing songs, uh, you know, that are worshipful and, and Christ centered and Christ centric, there's also an inspiration element as well. How do you navigate mm. in songwriting, the craft aspect of it and the inspiration af- aspect of it? And, and, you know, how do you kind of put all that together? You know, man, I think that life in Jesus what he's given us is like is rightness, you know, and I think maybe that's what we're striving for in songwriting, too, is just to find the right thing. And you kind of know it when it happens. Um, and so you're right. There definitely is an element because, OK, the the thing about scheduling and about all this business, you got to have a certain amount of songs done at a certain time so you can go in the studio and you can make a record and all, all of this business. That's the logistical part of it. But, man, there's so many gifted people in this town, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee. They're all sitting in little rooms all day long trying to come up with songs. And, like, there's a bunch of those songs that just sound like a bunch of guys are sitting in little rooms trying to come up with songs. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. And it's like it sounds just exactly like that. And you're like, oh, no. You know, Um, the feeling you get is like just is a bummer, you know. Uh, and I've been that guy and I've sat in those rooms and I've come up with some, some of the most worthless songs that I've ever had, you know, on certain days. What I've found though, is after, if you keep at it though, man, some good ones will show up. The best songs in my opinion are the songs that happen to you where you're doing something completely unrelated to writing a song. And all of a sudden you find yourself running for pen and paper or now it's just my iPhone with a little voice memo guy. You know, I just have to I put it all down there because that's <laughs> that is currently my brain. Evidently, you know, I just keep I keep everything in there. And so those are the ones that don't sound like that. Those are the ones that you you kind of then have to chase down after that. These little pieces of inspiration that happen. I have a friend named Michael Farron 
who's an incredible songwriter though, and he and he does chase songs, um, but he also chases the Lord in a really powerful way. And he said this, and this blessed me so much. He goes, "Man, you know, he goes, you know, you want to write when you're inspired." He goes, "But." you're not always inspired. He goes, so I say, right until you're inspired, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's exactly what happens. Sometimes those like really terrible songs, um, kind of like prime the pump for the real songs that come out. You know, I've had that happen a lot of times where I'll spend like the, you know, some weekdays and come home like so bummed. Cause I'm like, we, you know, we got a song, but it was not the song that had that life on it, man, that inspiration on it. But then two days later, when you're doing something again, unrelated to songwriting, something just happens. And those, that that's where it happens. And I really believe that it can be a result of just staying in there. Um, the best songs I think come from people who are, you know, they never stop writing, you know, and, um, it, it's not about, you know, having the hit every time, but it is about like this, this consistent, just there, they keep coming back. They keep coming back. They keep showing up, you know, day after day. And then all of a sudden, you know, along the way, there are these like gems that like occur, you know? And it's here in Nashville, you know, there's so many songwriters, you know, the, there's so many songwriter jokes. What's the first thing you hear when you meet a songwriter, your pizza's here, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, how many, how many songwriter jokes are there? I mean, there's thousands of them like that. Um, but I mean, I think that's, that is important. There is a craft element that sometimes you just have to sit down and I'm going to write, you know, I'm, I'm, I might not be feeling this big inspiration, but I'm going to write and work through this until the inspiration comes. And, and so now, you know, you've been in the industry now for uh, 18, 19 years making making records. And it's a different industry now than it was 18 years ago. You oh, could, my goodness. Yes. You could, you could feed your family on your CD sales 18 years ago, whereas now you can't. Uh, You're like, what CD sales? Right. You know? <laughs> there, nobody's buying plastic. I, uh, you know, was was talking to a, a, a have a songwriter on the on the show here who, a country writer who had you know just slews and slews of number ones country songs, and he was told, uh, you know, your your retirement's going to be your catalog, and now you know uh, he he's making maybe a thousand dollars every two months with his royalties off of you know the airplay that's being streamed. Uh, because the the money they pay when you stream music is so less than uh, what it used to be, so so now you, you've got this whole new uh, way of navigating songwriting. Uh, I got to go play in order to make to, to just support my family. I can't do it with CD sales anymore. So how does that change how you how you work as Big Daddy Weave as a songwriter? As how all those things put together as the music industry has completely turned into something different than it was 18 years ago. Yeah. Well, you know, fortunately <laughs> we have never known what we are doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so, so that is still true today. Um, but my life verse is Proverbs three, five and six, man, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understanding, know him in your ways, and then he'll make your path straight. And I feel like that's what's just been happening. I mean, it's people might think that I'm trying to make some kind of like over-spiritualized statement, but dude, that is literally what has been happening. You know, from the beginning of this, when we began being pursued by record labels, we looked at record contracts and we told everybody no, because it was terrifying looking to us. And even to this day, if, <laughs> I can't think of any other business deal that somebody would sign that looks like that. You know what I mean? It's like, but I tell people all the time, they're like, well, how do you, how do you do this or whatever? How do you get it? I said, run away if you can, you know, mm -hmm. but if you can't help yourself because the Lord's leading you somewhere, then just do what he says. That's the thing. And so, and, and that, that's going to go, that's a day by day thing, you know? And so for us with songs, man, there, there always have been like, man, how in the world are we going to make it? And, but somehow the Lord always makes a way, you know, and that's, that is it. It's about knowing Jesus. It really is. And I don't mean to turn this into a big sermon or whatever, but I, it, it just, it really is what's happened for us. I mean, and that's how we've been here for this long is, is we've seen the latest and greatest come and go, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we still get to do what we love to do after all this time. And it's only because of the grace of God, dude. It's not because we, 
with the greatest planners. It's not because of it's it's not. It's just not. You know, but the Lord has sustained us, man. Because if you if you get to looking at the numbers, if you get to looking at all those things, man, it will shut you down so quickly, you know? Um, because then you also have to if you live that way, you also have to upkeep that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and dude, that has never been that's never been the way we got anywhere. You know, we looked for the door that God opened and then we walked through that and we thanked him for it. And then he opened another door and then we walked through that door. You, you know, mm-hmm. it's, I, ho- I hope this makes sense, man. And I hope it doesn't sound overly spiritual or whatever, because well, it, it yeah, just, no. it's really, it's really what we've just been doing for the last, you know, 21 years, you know, cause we told everybody no. But then when I hung up with fervent records, I was troubled, man, in my heart. And so I called a dude named Bart Millard mm-hmm. and he, and man, he, I was like, Bart, you guys were, they were an independent band. And they, to us, they looked like they just had it all together. They had a bus, they had a, you know, all mm-hmm, this stuff. Mm-hmm. And we're like, man, you know, like how, why would you sign a record deal? And he just sat with us, man. And I knew I had missed it with the folks from fervent. And then, man, I met my wife at fervent. That's where I got, you know, she was the marketing director. She doesn't work for the label anymore, but man, she's changed my life forever, dude. Oh, and yeah. the Lord, the Lord brought her, man, the Lord brought her. And it was like, there's all these things that, that don't make sense. But where the peace of God goes, that's where we're trying to go. And man, then when you get there, his peace is available to you. You know, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it at does. All. It does. You know, it seems like like now in the industry, the only way to really amortize songwriting is to get songs in churches, uh, to get worship mm. songs. You know, the Chris Tomlin thing, where you'll get all these churches across America singing your song, and then you get the CCLI royalties, because the ASCAP royalties have gone away. The, the, the royalties that you get from streaming are, are virtually nothing. Um, you know, when the Pandora and the iTunes and I mean, that's, that's basically you know, non-existent. It's like, if you look at them like one at a time, it really is kind of nothing, but it's like all together after a while, they kind of start to make up something again. It's like, now mind you, you know, it has to be something that's happening now. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know that it's like what happened before we talk about like looking at a catalog. Man, dude, we're playing songs that for us were number one hits and people are thinking we're playing them a new song now because the audience just turns over and turns over right. and turns over, you know, so so often. But mm-hmm. it's like it it's that thing. I don't I don't know if the, the catalog is the retirement plan, but there there is a there is a way though, you know, it, when that streaming thing happens and it's like but it's a bunch of different you know, sources of that streaming, so, you know? So as you're writing, you're sitting down, you're writing, you got a new album coming out, you know, and, and you got to have 12 songs and that's just how it works. And, yep. and you got to find these songs. And then, but in the back of your head, you're going, you know, if we could get this song in churches, if we could <laughs> yeah. get churches to sing this song, we could maybe have some retirement or I could maybe help feed my family. And, you know, we all have jobs and we have families and feeding our families is an important thing. I mean, the Bible makes it very clear. I mean, if you aren't going to work for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So we're told yeah, to yeah. do that. So yeah, so then yeah. as we've got inspiration, we've got crafting, and then you've got this this thing. But if I get it in a church, you know, how do you navigate all that? Because obviously a church song is very different from a radio song, perhaps, you know, or maybe a song that is crafted differently the way Bob Dylan would write a lyric or whatever. And a church lyric is very simple, and the chords are very simple and very basic. That's a different kind of song. So how do you, as a recording artist, uh, kind of navigate all of that? Yeah, I think that you know, people – I mean, you, you'd think that or whatever, but then it's like that some years ago, like – David Crowder band will come out with a song that was not simple and it was not, but it then the, a younger generation would just sing the heck out of it, dude. You know, it's like, and I love that. So I, I run into people all the time who are trying to craft a song in that way. Um, and again, uh, are consistently let down by, Hey, how come my simple song didn't work when this other one did? And it really is about what's on it. It's about the life. It's about the life of God. It comes from the secret place. It comes from a real place that resonates with the church because we're talking about not just an organization. We're the, the real church is an organism, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing is that when you find something that resonates there, and I'm, my thing is, I don't think you can find it 
by going looking for it to resonate with churches. I think you have to find it out of relationship with God. Yeah. Because I think that's the thing that is going to overflow into that other thing. And then your gift will then, you know, make way, make room for you. Do you know what I mean? I do. Well, Mike, um, well, Mike, thanks for, you know, we're out of time. Man, this goes quick, doesn't it? Thanks so much for being on the show and sharing with us. You can uh, check out the band uh, Big Daddy Weave, uh, the 31st in Murfreesboro, and you can go to bigdaddyweave.com for more info. And Mike, God bless you as you write, as you uh, find inspiration uh, in the truth. Uh, keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you, man. God bless you, Dean. God bless. Thanks. If there's a show you've missed, you can go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and catch up. Or you can listen to my podcast in iTunes or wherever you hear your podcasts. Just search for The Rick Altizer Show. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. I want to thank you for listening. Hey, would you tell a friend about this show and share the love? Be sure to check us out again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's be clear so the world can hear. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.